Uh, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone in attendance and to the conference organizers. It's amazing to see how the scientific communication is adapting to the current situation we find ourselves in. And today I'll be talking about adaptation in the posterior parietal cortex. And this was work done in collaboration between my grad and postdoc laboratories. And it's been fun to meld the two worlds while analyzing a slightly older data set. So um, my research uh, has primarily focused on neural circuits important for spatial cognition and, and navigation. And today I'll focus on the dynamics of neurons that exhibit firing in an egocentric coordinate frame or relative to the animal itself. So neurons in multiple regions track the linear and angular speed of an animal, which is thought to underlie path integration computations for localizing oneself in space. And there are also egocentric responses that are not explicitly related to movement, such as neurons in the parietal cortex or lateral and terrenal cortex that respond to the position of a visual stimulus or a goal relative to the animal itself. And uh, many studies utilize simple paradigms like free foraging to study navigational processing, but intelligent behavior requires switching between unique forms of behavioral control. For instance, mice and rats forage, but also exhibit chase behaviors and hunt small prey. So uh, this paper from the Neil lab showed uh, mice chasing crickets. Um, predatory behaviors rely on visual information. So we designed a task in which rats pursued a visual target to explore how, na how navigational context alters cortical processing of these navigation relevant variables. And I just wanna quickly say that there's some awesome studies on the sphere colliculus and the zona inserta and their role in this predation behavior that uh, you should check out if you uh, are so inclined. So we trained rats to chase a uh, visual target projected onto the floor of a circular maze. And the target was experimental controlled uh, by, with a green laser pointer as you and the audience might have at once uh, played with a cat or a dog. Um, so we tracked the position of the animal and the target. Shown on the right are all of the paths uh, of the target in uh, blue, all of the paths of the rat in light gray, and all of the paths of the right in of the rat in dark gray when it's chasing the visual target. And the target primarily moved in pseudo random trajectories and the animal's goal was to intercept the target at which point the target would shut off and a reward was then delivered to a random location within the arena for the rat to retrieve, which uh, the trajectory to the retrieval is shown in these purple lines. And I hope these videos are playing for everyone. Um, I've had some problems with that in the past. Okay, uh, so we questioned whether rats would learn the presence of paths with a statistical regularity. So we embedded characteristic trajectories of the visual target amongst these random trajectories. And uh, shown to the right are all such paths in a single session, and then three individual examples. So each instance of a characteristic trajectory started and finished in relatively similar coordinates within the allocentric reference frame, and possessed this reliable recurrent shape that involved a stereotype sequence of actions and headings. And indeed, rats picked up on the presence of the characteristic trajectory and tracked the target more closely than during random paths. And we mapped the position of the target relative to the animal in egocentric coordinates. The animal's placed in the center of this, and then we can look to see where the target is to the left in front of or to the right of the animal. We do that for a single session. We can average it across all sessions. And we see that during the characteristic trajectories, the animal keeps the target in a smaller angular range than on the random trajectories, indicating that it's anticipating the position of the target. Further, rats showed that they had internalized this characteristic path by exhibiting predictive behaviors that we, for simplicity's sake, are referring to as shortcuts. So the video on the left shows one such shortcut, wherein the animal observed the trajectory of the target on a characteristic path and then cuts through the center of the maze rather than chases the target in order to intercept it. So to officially perform this task, animals must integrate sensory motor and spatial information of target trajectories to adapt self-motion behavior, especially in cases like these shortcuts wherein the animal executes action sequences in the spatiotemporally insightful manner. So we hypothesized that these computations may occur in the posterior parietal cortex which uh, possesses dense reciprocal connectivity with visual and sensory motor processing areas. And so to explore PPC dynamics, we record in the region while the animal performed the target chasing task, and then in separate sessions, free foraged in the same arena. And consistent with prior work, we observed parietal cortex neurons with self-motion sensitivity. So shown here are linear and angular speed tuning curves 
for six uh, neurons. Uh, each column is a single neuron, uh, linear and angular top and bottom. And greater than 50% of parietal cortex neurons were sensitive to the linear speed of the animal. And it took many different forms, as you can see from the variety of profiles here. Approximately 30% of the parietal cortex neurons exhibited significant self-motion tuning during pursuit. Um, and uh, more, sorry, uh, exhib exhibited significant angular tuning. And there were more neurons that were sensitive to self-motion tuning during pursuit than free exploration. And also self-motion tuning was more reliable during target chasing. PPC neurons also exhibited two forms of gain modulation as a function of task. So the color maps here show the linear speed tuning curves in free exploration on the left and pursuit on the right for cells with significant sensitivity. We split these neurons into subsets that had increased mean rate um, in free exploration on the top or increased mean rate in pursuit at the bottom and then sorted them by their peak firing within their preferred navigational epoch. And as demonstrated by the greater number of neurons in the bottom two plots, significant proportions of linear speed modulated cells had greater mean firing rates during the target pr pursuit session than during the foraging session. And the same was not true for angular speed sensitive neurons, wherein there were similar proportions. So accordingly, we can say that there's an additive gain on linear speed sensitivity during pursuit. But additive gain may not enhance the code for linear speed at the ensemble level, as the signal to noise ratio would essentially remain fixed under this scenario. So we next tested for the presence of multiplicative gain, which has been reported in numerous tasks, as well as in structures like the parietal cortex. And so to examine this, we fit Gaussian modified linear models to self-motion tuning curves. So here, uh, the model implements a linear regression with an additive 1D Gaussian parameters to capture any nonlinearities. And so the amplitude parameter schematized here can uh, reflect additional activation above a linear fit and can be thought of as modeling the magnitude of within receptive field firing. And consistent with the presence of multiplicative gain modulation, many linear and angular speed sensitive neurons had significant differences in the amplitude parameter between the two tasks. So the multiplicative gain ended up yielding uh, enhanced signal to noise ratios for linear speed sensitive neurons during pursuit uh, in comparison to free explore. And that's great, but the signal to noise ratio is only meaningful if it yields corresponding changes to the resolution of self motion decoding in downstream readers. So we decoded linear velocity in free exploration and pursuit independently and found that decoding accuracy was greater during pursuit in both uh, single neurons. So shown here is the decoding accuracy in pursuit versus free explore. So it's greater in both single neurons as well as when we decode it from ensembles. So we can better detect linear speed during target chasing. Um, this was true for the instantaneous relationship between neural spike trains and self-motion, but neurons can have temporally latent relationships to behavior. So we next ran the decoder after shifting the spike train relative to, uh, after shifting the spike chain relative to the behavior in 100 millisecond increments for two seconds forwards and backwards in time, and if decoding accuracy improves when the spike train is shifted backwards, this would indicate that the spiking activity is better related to the retrospective or history of self-motion state. And the reverse is true for forward shifts. So shown here are four example decoder latency curves for linear speed sensitive and angular speed sensitive cells. And the purple curve reflects decoding accuracy in pursuit and the gray in free explore and the dots indicate the peak decoding accuracy. And so overall, when we look at the full population of parietal cortex neurons that have linear speed sensitivity or angular speed sensitivity, we see is overall PPC decoding is greatest at non-instantaneous relationships to behavior and biased in the retrospective direction, indicating that self-motion sensitivity in parietal cortex actually reflects the history of movement or is more sensitive to the history of movement. So we next fit these decoder latency curves and discover that the temporal scale by which movement can be decoded from parietal cortex is significantly longer in duration during pursuit than during free explore, as depicted in the greater width of the purple curve versus the black curve here. So decodability extended through retrospective and prospective shifts of the spike train relative to the behavior. And this means that parietal cortex ensembles provide information about the past, present, and future self-motion state of the animal for longer time periods during pursuit, which could facilitate movement co coordination and prediction across multiple regions important for this predation behavior. And so finally, we wondered what is driving 
uh, these changes in the strength, the reliability, the gain, and the time scale of self-motion computation in parietal cortex uh, during pursuit compared to free explore. And an obvious possibility is the presence of the visual stimulus, which dictates movement commands. So we found that approximately 30% of parietal cortex neurons were significantly modulated by the egocentric position of the visual target, which we visualize here using uh, what we call rat to target rate maps, which simply show the activation of an individual neuron as a function of the position of the target relative to the animal. So we see a variety of different forms of, uh, of uh, visual target sensitivity, including neurons that have a wide bearing in which they are sensitive to the position of the target, but no real distance component. And then a larger proportion of neurons that have more restricted receptive fields that possess both egocentric bearing and distance components uh, with respect to their target receptive fields. We also saw that about half of the neurons with self-motion sensitivity were simultaneously sensitive to the position of the visual target as shown for this example neuron. So this neuron is sensitive to the target in front of the animal. It's also linear speed sensitive and angular speed sensitive in the sense that it prefers straightward motion. And so uh, we examine the distribution um, of amplitude and mean rate changes between neurons that tracked the target and neurons that did not and observed that target tracking self-motion cells had significantly greater gain modulation than those not sensitive to the possession of the egocentric target. And that's shown in the rightward shift of these cumulative density functions for linear speed. So both the amplitude and the mean of uh, gain modulation is higher for neurons that also track the target, you know, gener uh, creating sort of a, a potential mechanism, a coding mechanism for uh, the emergence of this gain modulation. And so in summary, we uh, trained the animals to perform this pursuit task. We found that there was greater reliability in self-motion sensitivity and greater numbers of neurons with self-motion sensitivity during the pursuit task, that there was multiplicative gain modulation that yielded greater decodability of, of uh, linear speed, and that neurons that were sensitive to linear speed that were also sensitive to the position of the target had greater gain modulation. And so we conclude that parietal cortex is dynamically integrating self-motion information in response to ongoing behavioral demands. And with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my advisors, uh, Doug Nitz and Michael Hasmo um, at UCSD and Boston University and my co-authors in bold. Um, there's a preprint forthcoming and um, yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'll take questions. And thank you, Andy. And notice he had on there that he's on the job market this year as well on his slide. So um, I got a, a couple of questions here for you, Andy. One is just a, a clarification question from the audience about um, whether the, the, the paradigm was blocked or alternating for your free exploration and your pursuit tasks. Yeah, it, so it was, al it was alternating blocks. So the animals would do the pursuit task first and then the free explore. And then we also counterbalanced that. We also had uh, ex experiments where we uh, uh, sandwich the pursuit session between two free explore sessions. Mm -hmm. Great. And then we have a question from Sapide Keshavazi, and she's actually asking the question I was going to ask. So thank you, Sapide. <laughs> Very nice talk. Andy, have you thought of or tried a similar chasing experiment where the target is not visual, i.e. a hunting task in the dark, so that you could tease apart the effect of visual versus purely goal-related changes in these gain modulations? That's a great question. No, we haven't done that. And that's certainly a direction that we could move forward with. Um, it is the case that um, the Neo lab showed that the uh, cricket hunting in mice was primarily dependent on visual information. So when they plugged the ears of the mice, auditory information was blocked, but the animals could still chase down the crickets. So we have to be careful about the exact design, but it's an interesting idea, certainly. And that's why I'm kind of interspersing uh, visual target and goal throughout um, the talk and, and the manuscript because uh, it's a bit ambiguous. Okay, so um, that's, uh, that'll do it for us for the time. Thank you very much, Andy. That was a really, really um, lovely talk. Thank you. And um, we will move on to the next speaker. And now we go from mice to Drosophila. And so uh, we're going to be learning about a path integrating circuit again. So um, exploring plasticity uh, in, in uh, the, these path uh, integrating circuits in Drosophila. And it, the talk will be presented by Pantelemon Vafedis.
take it away, Pantelemon. Thank you very much.